Good morning to all of you. I warmly welcome everyone for today's CPD program organized by Government Medical so Officers Association and Society for Health Research and Innovation. The webinar link will be open to you until 10 a.m. and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. You will be given CPD points which are strictly adhered to NCCPD guidelines. Apart from CPD points, you will be given a e-certificate for participation. The link for applying certificate will be sent to you through the chat box at the end of session. Also, we kindly ask you to mute your microphones and switch off videos to avoid any interruption during the session. So let me introduce Dr. Hima Losanda Kalama. Kalamarachi, Acting Consultant Physician, to introduce today's speaker. Hey, Dr. Malti, thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, webinar session on non-invasive ventilation. Today, our speaker is Dr. Jagak Pushpakumara. He's a consultant physician in internal medicine. Uh, he's actually a product of uh, Ruhuna Medical Faculty. Uh, and he, he got his MD in uh, Columbia Medical Faculty and he got a tra training, uh, foreign training in uh, uh, renowned uh, foreign training centers in UK. Uh, uh, one is, uh, uh, and uh, he got uh, uh, about two years uh, training in Basingbrook and North Hampshire Hospital in UK as a registrar in respiratory medicine. Uh, then he obtained his MRCP in UK and MRCP in London as well. And he received a postgraduate diploma in respiratory medicine in UK uh, year 2020. Uh, after uh, he returned to Sri Lanka, he's, he has worked in uh, two hospitals as a consultant physician based on Silvelva and uh, two COVID hospitals in Buttala. He's currently working in uh, Professor Senek Bibili Memorial Hospital in Bibile. His, he has a special interest on respiratory medicine, thoracic ultrasonography, plural procedures, and point of care ultrasonography. So without further ado, uh, I'll ask, uh, I'll invite Dr. Jagat Pushukumar to uh, start his talk on non-invasive ventilation. Dr. Jagat, sir, session is all to you now. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Yuval, and thank you very much for that kind words of introduction. GMOA. Sri Academy and the team as well as Dr. Nandini for giving me this opportunity to talk to you on um, NIV um, or non-invasive ventilation. Um, as Himal mentioned earlier at the beginning, so I'm not a respiratory physician, though I have a bit of interest on respiratory medicine. So I'm going to share my knowledge, which I gathered from the UK as well as um, while I was working in different hospitals. So let me share my screen first. Uh, can you see my slides, Himal? Yes, we can see you. It's crystal clear. Yeah, you can hope, go ahead. Uh, I hope others can also see um, the slides. Right. So, right. Um, so next one hour or so, I'm going to talk you um, or take you through about um, the following topics here: um, the understands of basics of non-invasive ventilation and the review of different types of NIVs. Uh, indication and contraindications for NIV, and what's the reason that COPD or, or CO2 retention occurs in patients with COPD, and how to start and manage NIV, and a bit of NIV troubleshooting, and review a few cases. And at the end of the presentation, uh, the questions which I have given to you already will be discussed as well. So this is a bit of literature that um, I googled or I searched. It's it says uh, non linear ventilation improves the outcome in patients with pneumonia associated respiratory failure. This is a uh, systematic review of um, meta analysis. Um, if you search Google, you will find lots of um, articles uh, on how NIV improves on um, patients care, patient care and improves the patient's uh, mortality benefit as well. And this is another one, of course, uh, outcomes of associated outcomes associated with uh, NIV over invasive ventilation. It says um, in a large respective cohort study, uh, patient with COPD treated with NIV at the time of hospital hospitalization had lower inpatient mortality, um, shorter uh, length of stay, and lower cost compared with those who received 
intermittent mandate ventilation or mechanical ventilation. All right, so well, let's start with the case scenario. This is one of the best that I came across when I was working in the UK. She was a um, 63 year old lady who admitted to um, the hospital with worsening shortness of breath and productive cough for three days duration. She had also fear for two days and she had increased lethargy for two months. Um, her excess tone is normally only 20 yards, but for the last few um, weeks or so, she had been gradually declining. Um, her past medical history included um, she was diagnosed to have COPD for three to four years ago, and she was also um, known to have atrial fibrillation for which she was on uh, warfarin, um, and she had osteoarthritis as well. So these are the medications on the mission, which you all normally know, so salbutamol, aldronic acid, um, some calcium supplements, warfarin, and all other uh, necessary medications for COPD management. So um, social history, she was a smoker for 45 years, yeah, um, um, generally 20 cigarettes per day, and she has stopped smoking five years ago. And no history of um, ethanol or alcohol use. She was self-employed, but now retired, and a widow, and she lives alone, and she normally works with a stick at home. So these are the admission observation um, during the ED. Her temperature was 37.7, blood pressure was like 140, heart rate was a bit high is 130, respiratory is again high is 34. Uh, saturation or SpO2 on 24.1% uh, of um, FiO2 is 89. She was dehydrated, normal heart sounds, the jugular venous pulse was normal, there wasn't any lymphadenopathy. Auscultation revealed she had um, widespread polyphonic inspiratory and uh, expiratory factors, hyperresin on percussion, and she was using uh, accessing muscles for breathing. Um, and abdomen was uh, soft and non tender. And this is a chest section. You can see there are lots of changes of um, chronic lung disease. It's hyperinflated, elongated mediastinum, lots of fibrotic and some reticular shadows as well. And there may be a bullet here as well. It looks like she, it's pretty horrible chest X-ray. Of course, with regard to her past medical history of smoking 40 years or so, so it's no wonder that she could um, acquire this uh, chest X-ray. Um, these are the bloods on admission. Hemoglobin was 16.1, platelet was high. Um, her white cell count was 26,000. Uh, the neutrophil count is predominant, INR 6.9. Electrolytes were normal and she had evidence of CO2 retention. Um, as the CO, uh, bicarbonate is quite high. Her renal functions were normal, but the CRP was high, which reflects that she is probably having an underlying chest infection as well. So this is a blood gas in the resuscitation unit. So by looking at the blood gas, what would you do? So looking at the pH, she is pretty acidotic. And then you have to see the primary uh, disorder. If you look at the CO2 and bicarbonate, you can identify that CO2 is very high compared to, it's, it's even more than double the upper normal limit, which is quite high, and she's hypoxic as well. And saturation was 86, basic, base excess is 13, and the bicarbonate is 35, which means that the patient is having um, chronic CO2 retention and the metabolic part is trying to compensate. So what did we do that um, do we after the um, ABG? So the post-ABG decisions were, I mean, um, there's something called ceiling of care or at which point or to which point we go maximum for a given patient. And that normally should be decided by the clinician as well as uh, after discussion with the patient and the family as well, considering all the medical and the comorbidities factors as well. So likewise, we decided um, that this patient NIV is a ceiling of care or the maximum care that we can support. She's not a candidate for ICU um, or intubation and ventilation or, or, or um, level three treatment. So. She was started on BiPAP and then continue uh, the treatment for community and pneumonia as well. And she was not for HDU I2 admission and uh, she had uh, DNA CPR form uh, placed in situ. Um, um, well, at the outlook, the outlook was very bad at this patient, so we did not expect her to last for the rest of the day. So that was the case of, uh, I mean, we do see this kind of cases every day in our daily practice as well. But see how far we can go in our, in our country as well. So interaction 
We're coming to NIV. So NIV is a provision of ventilatory support through the patient's upper airway using a mask or a similar device or a similar uh, interface. So it's a non-invasive interface as the name, name implies because we are not using um, invasive like endotracheal tube, or tracheostomy tubes. So we normally use either nasal mask or face, face mask or a nasal plug. So it's very important to um, select the patients for NIV because um, every patient with COPD are not, may not be eligible for to receive uh, NIV. It's because it's, you need um, careful consideration which patients needs or which patient will comply and which patient will not comply. So before talking about NIV, there are a um, couple of terminology that you should be aware of um, under the NIV basics. So we use I mean, in NIV, we, we normally use a pressure control. We are not going to control the volumes or any other thing. It's just pressure control ventilation. It's type of pressure control ventilation. Um, so there are two or three things that we should be aware of. One thing is called IPAP or the inspiratory positive airway pressure. And the other thing is expiratory positive airway pressure or EPAP. And, and, and the other thing is pressure support. So IPAP is... Um, pressure on inspiration to increase the tidal volume. So when you increase IPAP, I mean, your tidal volume increases as well. So it's directly proportional to the tidal volume. So what we'll do, what we'll do is, um, what, what IPAP will do to the patient, it will ensure the sufficient removal of CO2, which is the most important thing um, when you um, connect to a patient with NIV. As well as this inspiratory support also help to alleviate the patient's sensation of breathlessness. And we know these patients are very, um, agitated sometimes and very um, breathless. So it just helped to alleviate these symptoms as well. Um, EPAP or expiratory positive airway pressure is, um, so what it does is uh, um, it opens up, it, it, it delivers a pressure during the expiration to overcome the obstruction or airway collapse. And it maintains positive pressure in the airway at the end of the expiration, which will improve the compliance of the alveoli making the expansion of expansion during the inspiration easier so it mainly helps oxygenation right and the pressure support is the pressure difference between ipap or epap or the amount of pressure that we impose or apply above the epap right so people sometimes classify that niv is um, an umbrella term under which you get the BiPAP or bilevel positive airway pressure or CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure and then high flow nasal oxygen. But however, if, if someone or generally speaking, NIV implies BiPAP, not CPAP or um, high flow oxygen therapy. So because of that reason, I'm not going, not going to talk about these two, but rather we'll be talking on this mainly. So BiPAP is bilevel positive airway pressure is a mode used during non invasive positive pressure ventilation or NPPV, right? So as I mentioned earlier, it delivers two different types of pressures, like they all are preset and we know what pressures are, we are uh, delivering. So as I mentioned earlier, one is IPAP, the other one is EPAP. And the tidal volume, is it correlates with the difference between IPAP and the EPAP. Higher the IPAP, higher the tidal volume. As I mentioned earlier, when you increase IPAP, the tidal volume goes up. So in contrast with um, NIV, um, CPAP is continuous positive airway pressure. There's no cycling like uh, different, there's no different levels of pressure during the respiratory cycle. Here it is same pressure or continuous pressure throughout the respiratory cycle. So the problem with this is patient must initiate all breaths because then the machine is not going to support unless the patient does not initiate the um, normal breathing. And there won't be any additional pressure above the level of CPAP, which the machine provides. So it's normally it's used in, uh, you know, commonest indication is acute pulmonary edema failing or in, in addition or when it's failing with the medical management. Um, and the other two things are sleep related breathing disorders such as obstructive sleep apnea and obesity hypertension syndrome or OHS. But these, um, the first and the third indications most of the patients um, in the UK, I mean, uh, they receive domiciliary CPAP rather than in hospital. They initially assessed and then uh, they were given their individual or personal CPAP machines and um, they, they can use that when they're at home. But of course, um, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, the patients 
come in with acute presentation and those patients are treated in hospitals with um, CPAP in addition to the medical management. So the pressure control, um, as some of the terminology not really bothered about. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, inspiratory pressure and the inspiratory time are set and fixed. The patient won't be able to change. It's useful in neuromuscular disease because a patient does not have respiratory muscle strength to generate the adequate inspiratory time. Uh, sometimes it may increase patient ventilated dyssynchrony um, when the patient, uh, the desired inspiratory time is not uh, telling with the machine's uh, set time. Um, these are some of the machines that you can use to deliver NIV. The first one is a domiciliary NIV machine. Uh, this is a very famous one in these days or even um, over the last two to two years probably because uh, this is Prismid still 100 or 150. Those are similar machines and they can deliver CPAP and NIV from the same machine. So there are two modes that you can use. And I have been using this is a very uh, handy tool and it's very easy to um, handle um, by even the you know, um, normal healthcare person such as you know, um, nurses and other people. Um, this is a very advanced um, ventilator, it's Hamilton C3. Some of you must have seen this, but it's a really good one. This machine will, will provide um, mechanical ventilation plus NIV plus high flows and all in one. It's a really good machine. Um, this is an example of how a patient is being given domiciliary NIV at home. So, I mean, it's normally recommended by the respiratory physicians after assessing um, lots of um, aspects. So this patient should receive um, NIV. So after which they will receive their own machine and they are given instruction and there is a team that the people, um, they will come and uh, or they can call and they can get instructions or advices. Right. Um, and also there are different types of masks as well. So the first one here is and the full face mask, which is what we normally used in our hospitals. And this one is called total face mask. Of course, I haven't seen this one this in uh, Sri Lanka, but in the UK, yes. Um, when do you use uh, the total face mask over the full face mask is when you, I mean, you initially start with this one or a nasal mask. If there is a significant leak because the facial deformity or so, then you can go to the, the chain the face mask, which will improve the leak and the patient might be uh, a bit comfortable, but some people, of course, are uh, claustrophobic and they don't want to be uh, keep their eyes under this uh, total face mask. So they, some patients may not like this. The nasal masks are very comfortable as well. It, it will cover the, the nose only and it has different si um, sizes as well. So small, medium and large. And this is called mouthpiece. You can use this for NIV as well. And these are nasal pillows or nasal cushions can also be used in patients uh, patient who are receiving high flow nasal oxygen. Um, this I haven't seen um, uh, even in the UK, but it may be available there. The place where I worked uh, is, in the, is a helmet. So it's when uh, your all um, devices are failing, you may use this. Um, let's talk about indications for NIV. The commonest indication we use NIV, but just remember that if I use NIV throughout my talk, it generally refers BiPAP. So, um, Infect, um, IE COPD is infected excavation of COPD with type of respiratory failure. The treatment of choice is normally BiPAP or NIV. Um, some patients who have been ventilated at the ICU, when they wean off, they can also change to um, NIV if the patient can uh, maintain the airways. So pulmonary edema, you, may, you can use CPAP, but if the gases are deranged, if the patient has gone into uh, BiPAP, uh, um, gas, gases are going into type 2 respiratory failure, you may use BiPAP as well. This normally happens with patients with um, both cardiac and respiratory illnesses, and then uh, if they get um, exacerbation, both system at the same time. And the patient with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, which is type 1 respiratory failure, they can be treated with either CPAP or high flow nasal oxygen. And um, then what are the contraindications of NIV? Um, so these are the set of contraindications, but generally there are like some absolute contraindication and some relative contraindications as well. So if someone needs urgent or emergency intubation, it is an absolute contraindication. We are not um, playing with NIV when somebody is in cardiac arrest or when somebody is in pending arrest. 
Um, if the patient cannot cooperate or protect their airway, for example, very low GCS patient like GCS 4-3 following stroke, of course, we are not going to put them on an IV. And some patients have um, impaired conscious level, uh, non-respiratory organ failure, that is actually life-threatening, we are not going to put them onto an IV. And some of the re relative contraindication may be like facial surgery, trauma or deformity, and high aspiration risk prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation. If you anticipate that this patient will need ICU admission and uh, would need mechanical ventilation, of course, we are not going to put them on NIV at the first time. And if the patient has had esophageal surgeries or if the patient has got undrained pneumothorax, you are not supposed to commence them on NIV. If someone has got pneumothorax and the chest strain is in situ, of course, you can use NIV very safely. Um, what are the potential harms harms with NIV? Of course, um, there are no major harms, but the, it's generally safe. You may get some skin damages or um, minor abrasions if the masks are tight or straps are um, very tight. Um, there may be leaks. It depends on the patient's facial um, symmetry and the mask that you use. Um, some patients may get eye irritation, sinus pain, and sinus congestion. Um, some Patients might get gastric distension as well because uh, some of them can go into the um, stomach as well. So this is something, um, for example, assume that you are driving in um, uh, expressway or a highway with a rate of, um, let's say, speed of 100 kilometers per hour. And if you put your head out of the window, you might feel that very strong wind blowing into your, uh, onto your face. So something like this, very pressurized air coming and hitting on your face. So it may be uncomfortable but when you get used to that it's, it's very um the patients are very comfortable the important thing is you need to advise the patients from the beginning what is niv and how it works and how it helps the patient's condition um so why do you get co2 retention uh, when you come when you when you um, consider about patient with copd um, there are lots of changes happening inside their chest as lungs as well as the whole physiology i'm not going to talk um in detail physiology this is um, a very um, com complex looking uh, formula but what happens uh, uh, with COPD patients their minute ventilation goes down and their dead space increases as a result CO2 production will go up inside the uh, inside their body so this is again uh, the same thing so decreased minute ventilation and global hyperventilation and then they increase dead space so, you know most of the areas of the lungs um, are not being properly ventilated because compliance is poor. As a result, they get uh, increased CO2 production, but there are other conditions as well that you can get uh, increased CO2 uh, production inside your body, such as like fever, thyrotoxicosis, you know, all other sepsis uh, that you normally know. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, COPD increases dead space, is initially compensated by increasing their tidal volume or, or minute ventilation by increasing the respiratory rate. So those are the people that we call earlier pink puffers, but we don't normally use that term anymore. And uh, they, uh, when they lose that ability, to, ability of compensation, they will become cyanotic. So then they, those people are called blue bloaters. Right. So some of the patients, you know, we, you know COPD is graded in, uh, you know, grade A, B, C, D, according to the goal classification. So some patients, they are hypercapnic, but when you treat the exacerbation, they go back to the normal blood gas research. So some patients might not actually need COPD, but with the medical management, you can uh, cure them completely, um, that episode. So the other causes of CO2 retention are if the patient cannot breathe or patients unable to breathe, they, they both look similar, but uh, the causes are slightly different. So for example, patient can't breathe if he's under overdose of sedatives, such as like narcotics or benzodiazepines or encephalitis or strokes and those, those kind of things. Some patients are unable to breathe effectively. So these patients are the patients who are having neuromuscular disorders or any you know, features of guillain barre any actually the um, musculoskeletal uh, issues and kyphoscoliosis. Right, so this is what happens uh, when your CO2 level goes up. It indicates different colors here. So the volume of um, um, CO2 volume percentage in air, if it's like 1%, 3%, 5%, 8%, you can see what happens here. 
so one percent is the lowest one so you could just drowsiness only but if it goes up and up they get reduced hearing narcosis and then further up you get dizziness confusion and headache and then when it is pretty high of eight percent you get um, unconscious and dim light sweating tremors and all so at, at that point your co2 levels are very high inside the body all right so the type 2 failure is also known as hypercapnic respiratory failure we know that it is co2 retention plus hypoxia right or the hypercapnia and hypoxia and if you consider the uk um, um statistic it says acute hyper hypercapnic respiratory failure results in 50,000 admissions in each year in the uk i don't know how many in our hospital because uh, there's there's no uh, recent published trials or studies done um, so most of these patients without respiratory support or ventilator support, they are at higher risk of dying. Right, so it says that incidence of acute hypercapnic respiratory failure is similar to upper GI bleeding. So without vigilant identification and management, the mortality is very high. Right, so suppose you get someone with um, either pre-existing pre diagnosis of COPD or new patient coming with um, type 2 respiratory failure. And then of course, uh, the treatment of choice uh, is early initiation of NIV. So this is um, um, nice guidelines. Or, um, and of course, there are other you know, pretty much similar, but local guidelines as well, de depending on the individual um, trust in the UK. So this is um, the um, algorithm or when to start and how to start. So potentially reversible acute hypercapnic respiratory failure and or increased work of breathing. Then this is specific other indications as well, as I mentioned earlier, like uh, muscular uh, chest wall deformities and all, and kyphoscoliosis. So initially, assess the COPD or someone with COPD, assess the blood gas, look at the pH, if it's less than 7.35 and your CO2 level more than 6.5 and the respiratory rate is more than 23, despite one hour of medical med this is very important, this, that anyone who is coming with exacerbation of COPD plus type 2 respiratory failure, you need to initiate the medical management first, which includes back-to-back -back nebulization with um, um, salbutamol and iprovent or ipratropium plus steroids, antibiotics, uh, and other supportive treatment. And you look for, and you wait for one hour and then repeat the blood gas. If there's no good improvement, of course, next step is to start NIV. And we are not going to start NIV straight away, just, just the moment we saw the gas, right? And other patients um, here, of course, neuromuscular diseases, if they're respiratory, um, respiratory, if they're coming with respiratory illness, with a respirator of more than 20, and their vital capacity is then one liter or pH less than 7.3 and CO2 more than 6. Point, of course, an indication to start uh, NIV. Um, important thing here is suppose someone, you know, young patient coming with, you know, diagnosed patient with asthma coming with exhibition of asthma and you found the blood gas is in type 2 failure and should not be started on NIV. Those patients should go to ITU directly, ITU, HDU, because next step would be life threatening asthma and then they can collapse. So, in general speaking, NIV is not usually indicated in asthma. Right. Um, and before you commence, you look for the contraindication, as I, as I mentioned earlier, unbrained pneumothorax, facial burns, upper GI, upper GI obstruction, and at least uh, two weeks post is Right. There are some relative contraindications as well, you know, pH less than 7.15, GCSS and 8, or vomiting. So what happens with vomiting, if somebody is having persistent vomiting and you put on the CPAP um, NIV mask on, you know, it's connected with tight straps. If the patient vomited while the mask is on and with this pressurized air, all the gastric contents can go back to the lung. So patient can die instantly, which is why the vomiting is a relative contraindication. You may, you may insert NG tube initially and you may drain the gastric content and then you can uh, put them on safely on the NIV. But there is a practical uh, difficulty when there is the NG tube going on and it is difficult for you to fix the mask. Uh, the leak can uh, increase when, there is, when it is not sealed around your uh, respiratory or, 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 or face. 
And of course, uh, there are indications that you should not delay for the patient who needs ICU referral. For example, a uh, patient with type 2 failure uh, who are diagnosed to have bronchial asthma rather than COPD and impending respiratory arrest. And if you cannot maintain the uh, normal hemodynamics or parameters while using NIV, which means the patient is further deteriorating. Right. So this is the NIV setup, as I mentioned earlier. Um, no, you know, when you, when you switch on the machine, I mean, there are different machines that you should be familiar with because the machine to machine is different. I use um, either Flight 60 portable ventilator or Respect Stella 100. But likewise, you have different machines in your hospital. Um, most of these machines have this facility. So starting pressure is you go to the spontaneous time mode or ST mode if the patient can breathe on his own. And then uh, IPAP normally starting pressure is 10 to 15, but this is changed later in 2016 guideline. This is 2008 guideline. So you start with IPAP of 10 to 15 and the EPAP of 4. But you may have to go a little higher in patient with OSA because they are, they are, they are pressures, uh, they need a bit of higher pressures. But generally speaking, do not go beyond 8. These pressures are mentioned in water centimeters, not in the mercury millimeters. So the starting pressure of um, NIV is 10 to 15, but this was changed in 2016 to um, you start with straight away 15 and ramp up um, accordingly until you get the desired uh, tidal volume and the patient feels better. And the later in 2016, again, this EPEP uh, changes to uh, 3 as well. But in general speaking, you can still start 10 to 15 of IPAP and EPEP for 4. As well as you must remember that if the patient is quite big, you know, as a muscular man or a woman, then you may have to go a bit higher pressures. If the patient is very thin built, like, you know, 30, 40 kilos, you may start with pressures of IPAP of 10. And the most important thing again here is explain the treatment to the patient prior to fitting the mask. I will show you in one of the um, um, uh, videos down in the, in the next few slides. So when you start the NIV with, let's say the 10 and the four, and then you increase IPAP over 10 to 13 minutes, you know, within half an hour to 20 to 30 water centimeters, but not straight away. Um, you normally go by two. So if it's 10, you go by the next step, next step is 12 and then 14 so until you get the desired um, um, amount of hemodynamics uh, until the hemodynamics improve, which means um, patients uh, respiratory rate and saturation sometimes as well. So important thing to remember here is do not exceed um, IPAP of more than 30 because that high risk of barrel trauma. But you can go up to 34, 38 sometimes in a patient with, uh, especially the uh, obese patient with OSA. Right, but as I said, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, better, um, better not to exceed EPA for eight as well. And there are other things called that, um, you know, I time, IE time. But generally speaking, for a COPD patient, IE ratio is, you know, expiration inspiration ratio is one to two to one to three, because you need a bit of longer period to empty the carbon dioxide. You know, carbon dioxide is um, removed during the expiration for which you need a bit of longer time than the inspiration. Patient with neuromuscular disorders or obesity, hypertension syndrome, OHS, you can put, uh, you can set the IE ratio to one to one. So how to monitor the NIV when you start somebody on NIV? Of course, uh, you need to monitor them, you know, continuous cardiac monitoring and saturation at least the first 12 hours. The patient should be connected to the uh, multipara monitor and should be monitored and, and the maintenance chart should be um, uh, followed. Ensure the patient's CO2, oxygen, and SpO2 parameters are set. We'll tell you later again. Right, so after NIV setting, if the CO2 remains high, so what you should normally do, I will come into another slide, um, uh, the following slide. You initiate them on uh, NIV with the given pressures, for example, like let's say 10 and 4, and then you have to repeat, you have to do the blood gas in 30 minutes to one hour and see you, whether your pressures are doing the job. If not, this is what to do. If CO2 remains high, increase tidal volume. So you cannot increase tidal volume, but what you should do is you increase IPAP. When the IPAP increase, your tidal volume automatically uh, increase. If the patient's oxygen is low, when saturation is low, or patient remains hypoxic, then of course increase EPAP. You started here probably four, and then you probably go up to five or six. Or you can also increase FIO2. Remember, um, 
too much of oxygen uh, patient who are very sensitive to oxygen or CO2 can uh, uh, de uh, deteriorate if you do too much oxygen. Whatever you do, and you must update that in the NIV management chart. I will show you that in later, in later side as well. Right, so use, um, use NIV as much as time as possible in the first 24 hours. And they mentioned, the literature mentioned, of course, that at least or minimal 16 hours should be uh, connected to the NIV machine during the first 24 hours. It is not ideal for you to take the NIV off. For example, if you start NIV in the morning at let's say 8 a.m., so it's not safe to take the patient um, off from the NIV machine in the afternoon or so. At least you must try to give or provide NIV as long as possible during the first 24 hours or at least 16 hours. Of course, you can allow the patient to eat and drink. So that those things are called meal breaks, which normally can last only for 15 to 20 minutes, during which you can give control oxygen via either venturi mask um, or nasal cannula. Right? And then patient should go back to the NIV with the same settings. So, um, so next 48 to 72 hours depend on ABG and clinical review. So some patients, I mean, I have experience, we've been providing NIV for, you know, five to seven days and it's difficult to be enough. And some patients, of course, their gases improve the following day and then we can uh, uh, wean them off within two to three days. Right. If any patient's pH goes down or CO2 levels goes up and NIV is not tolerated, of course, you need to uh, in, in, um, you need to get the support from the experts. And we'll come to the uh, troubleshooting at the latter part of this presentation, right? Okay. So this is one of the guidelines that world um, famous BTS guidelines or British Thoracic Society. But of course, there are lots of guidelines as well. The one thing is called European Resuscitation, uh, sorry, European Respiratory Society. And uh, there are some uh, ACP guidelines as, as well. Um, so BTS guidelines, they have combined COPD, OHS, neuromuscular disorder, chest wall disorder, all into one if they are having type 2 failure. So the recommendations, the first recommendation, of course, you must avoid them getting into hypercapnic respiratory failure. So when someone comes to hospital, you, there are ways that you can prevent them into going into respiratory failure. So oxygen should be used with care in all individuals at risk of acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. And of course, use a target oxygen saturation ranges from 88 92. This is very important. COPD patients, they, 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 most of those patients are in chronic respiratory failure or CO2 retainers. If we, tries to, if we, if we try to um, correct the oxygen level to 94 or above, they will definitely deteriorate. Because of that, they have given a low saturation target, which is 88 to 92, in all self-ventilating patients at risk of hypercapnic respiratory failure. I, I, I even have seen there are, I mean, we, we maintain even lower saturation than this, like, you know, early 80s, like, um, um, yeah, for patients who are at, at high risk of uh, developing type 2 respiratory failure. If someone needs oxygen, of course, you should start them on controlled oxygen um, uh, treatment, which is via a venturi mask, which is why you, this is called a fixed performance device, and you can start with 24%, and then you can gradually go up until you get the desired target of 88 to 92. Right. So the recommendation two is consider NIV when pH is less than 7.35, CO2 more than 6.5 in kilopascal, and the respiratory rate is 23. Consider starting NIV in hypercapnic patients with neuromuscular disorders or chest wall disorders uh, in, the, in the absence of acidosis. You don't have to wait till the patient develop acidosis, but in, if you have these two, of course, you can commence them on NIV. NIV should not be used in acute hypercapnic asthma and must go to the ITU. Um, do not delay starting NIV or continue with it when the patient is deteriorating as both increased mortality, right? So as I mentioned earlier, should not delay as well. And if the patient is deteriorating, I mean, either, either way patient can um, die. So these are the differences from 2008 guideline to uh, 2016 uh, BTS guideline. Indications, we know that we have, um, uh, we have uh, gone through the indications of NIV 
In 2008, they mentioned pH 7.35 and uh, pH less than 7.35 and CO2 more than 6. But later, it, um, the later it changed to um, pH remains the same, but CO2 more than 6.5 and respirate, they have included the respirate more than 23 as well. And this is what we follow up now. But um, pressures wise, you can uh, start from 10 to 15 as well. So setting up for NIV, here, of course, uh, <clears throat> this says um, CT2 is co trainers 2 in the UK, which equals to, let's say, house officer or senior house officer so above. But in our setup, um, medical office, any medical officer who is competent or who has been using NIV can initiate patients on NIV after discussing with their immediate supervisors. So the differences from 2008 guideline, 2016 guideline, as I mentioned earlier, 2008 IPEP, in starting IPEP was 10, but of course it changes to um, changed to a 15 um, later, right? And remember that up titrate over 10 to 30 minutes to IPEP of 20 to 30 to achieve the augmentation and chest abdo movements and reduce respiratory rate. Don't, <clears throat> don't hesitate to increase um, pressures um, until you get the desired uh, improvement. So 2008, it was um, starting pressure was EPAP was four to five, but now it is three, but still you can start with four. There are no hard and fast rules. In our patient, of course, their body habitus is different. Their, their, their weight, weight is low compared to the Caucasians. So you might but remember this um, 15 and three, but of course it always individualized and differs from the patient to patient. Um, EPAP should not exceed eight unless there is, unless the patient is having severe obstructive sleep apnea or obesity hyperintensity syndrome. If you need to increase beyond this, of course, you need to uh, discuss with the super, um, supervisor or the, uh, the consultant. So this is a summary of um, the last 15 to 20 minutes, which I um, talk. So someone who is coming with COPD, pH less than 7.35, CO2 more than 6.5, and your respiratory is more than 23, um high risk of deterioration or patient with neuromuscular diseases and patient with obesity with PHS and 7.35 co2 more than 6.5 and respirator more than 23 or daytime pco2 more than 6 and somnolent those patients are candidate for niv and filter the patient with the contraindication see whether the patient has got absolute or to contraindication before you put them on niv as I mentioned earlier, absolute contraindications are severe facial deformity, facial burns, fixed upper airway obstruction, upper airway obstruction. The relative ones are the pH less than 1.15, or confusion, agitation, vomiting, or non cooperative patients. And those patients, you select them carefully and then refer to the ITU accordingly. Right? And then you set up the NIV, you select the mask, I will tell you how to do that, and then start the initial pressures of uh, EPAP3 and the IPAP 15, according to the 2016 guideline. And then you ramp up the pressures over 10 to 30 minutes until you get the desired improvement, like, you know, adequate augmentation of chest abdomen movements and uh, slowing of the respiratory rate. And it should not, you should not exceed pressure uh, IPAP of 30 and EPAP of eight without expert review, right? And then you can adjust these things as well in your machine i.e. ratio normally 1.2 to 1.1 1 to 2 to 1 to 3 in patient with COPD, but it is 1 to 1 in patient with OHS or neuromuscular disorders and chest hole deformities. You can set all these things because different machines has different um, setups, so which, um, I'm not going to uh, talk about without the uh, demonstration. All right. Then oxygenation is important once you connect the patient to the NIV machine. And next thing is to uh, maintain it and look for troubleshoot um, and then red flag signs. Um, right. Uh, so oxygenation is important. Again, we are not going to achieve the saturation of 94 or above. AM saturation of 88 to 92 in all patients with who are self-ventilating. And uh, and of course, uh, look for any red flag signs. So this is I mentioned earlier: asthma and pneumonia not for NIV, they should either go to HTU or ITU. So uh, use NIV as much as time during the first 24 hours, taper depending on the tolerance and APG next over 40, 48 to 72 hours. Seek and treat 
uh, reversible process of uh, respiratory failure, which includes if the features, um, if, the, if the patient is having a pneumonia or coexisting infection, correct the hydration, correct their blood sugars and all. So all the supportive treatment should be given along with NIV. And look for the red, pla red flag signs as well. If the patient is, is the patient deteriorating while on the NIV, then of course you have to act accordingly, whether the chest, uh, whether the patient needs intubation and ventilation or whether the patient needs to go to ITU for further management. So um, in the emergency department or in the acute admission, early gases and act quickly on the ABG. So when you come across a patient with um, COPD or someone who is coming with type 2 failure, of course, early blood gases are important and then act on the blood gas promptly. I know that there is um, island-wide um, reduction or shortage of blood gas facility even in our ICU. Uh, we don't have blood gases at the moment. Um, the cartridges are out of stock. So we are in uh, difficulty as well. So, um, but anyway, this is how it should be managed and it should go. Um, so you initially, uh, initially, initially commence the medical management, uh, which includes nebulizations, antibiotics, um, controlled oxygen, steroid, etc. And of course, you can uh, maintain the patient. patient uh, you can manage the patient in a not non overcrowding area because these patients sometimes claustrophobic, and uh, you can keep them in a calm and quiet environment. Um, this is um, very frequent thing that I have seen in the UK blowing a fan towards the patient face because these patients, uh, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> these patients uh, feel that they are in air hunger, so they a bit of anxious. So if you um, blow a fan towards their face, they might feel a bit of psychological comfort, but it's, it's nothing to do with the management anyway. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, don't be afraid of ramp up the pressures quickly. So you start with initial pressures, which I mentioned earlier, and then um, go up according to the um, guidelines. So it is important to um, do, um, get the initial chest film or chest radiograph to rule out pneumothorax, but clinical but don't wait until you get the x-ray done. You have to uh, justify with your clinical findings whether the patient is having pneumothorax or not. And if you think the patient has no pneumothorax, of course, these days we have um, portable ultrasound scans in most of the EDs, so you can keep the probe on the chest and see whether you, have, you can, you can uh, diagnose um, uh, bedside um, ultrasonography, and then you can diagnose and exclude uh, pneumothorax even before the check x has happened. Right, so, and of course, be cautious about bullous disease as well. Um, right, if the NIV is failing or if the patient is not improving, see what, what's happening. Of course, you have to um, educate the patient first, as I mentioned earlier, and then see whether the mask is properly fitting, ad adequate mask size is applied, and trigger settings and rise time. And if the patient is claustrophobic, again, you need to educate the patient. Um, some patients who are really, really unwell or frail, frail patients, of course, these patients may not be a suitable candidate for uh, NIV with their given multiple comorbidities. So, in which case, are we prolonging the inevitables? So, better risk the patient, the family, and then decline, and then better to uh, carry on with uh, support you, best support you care. So, this I, of course, uh, demonstrated earlier the different types of machines that you can use um, to deliver NIV. So this is one of the machines which I used in the UK. This is uh, Philips Trilogy. Uh, so just to um, show you the monitor. So it says IPAP is 20, EPAP is six, and the pressure is from here to there. And as so again, the FIO2, you can change the FIO2 from the um, um, oxygen port. And then uh, it says here is 28%. Uh, as, a, as again, the pressure is uh, so this is breath rate. You can set the machine uh, breath rate of 12 to 14, and it depends on the patient's blood gases as well. Right. So just a little video how to attach a NIV machine to a patient, because I know most of you must have used this, but see whether we are doing it properly. Um, especially when I was working in the uh, COVID unit uh, at Butler Hospital, and we had to give um, NIVs, um, CPAPs, and high flows very frequently. Uh, the problem with the nurses or the health staff is they are in um, mess, you know, they, they, they may make it mess when they kind of the mask to the patient's face because these straps are, you know, quite long or they are short and they just tie here and there and it's very, um, uh, it's not pleasant looking, by the way. 
to a patient. So first we're going to go through the equipment and then we'll go through how to attach the machine to the patient. In our department, all of our kit in a tray, which is kept in a stack. So first of all, we would need to go to the stack to get the appropriate tray. In the the tray we have the oxygen tubing and filter we have three sizes of masks that go over the patient starting with small medium and large we also have oxygen tubing for giving supplemental oxygen nebulizer attachment for giving nebulized medication and for patient comfort silk tape that goes over pressure areas of the mask our paperwork is also kept in this tray that we fill out when commencing non invasive ventilation everything that should be kept in the tray is listed in the tray so it's easier for us once it's been used to make sure that we stock up effectively now we'll go through how to size the mask for the patient. So when you're sizing up the mask, you want to size up in level with the eye and the lower part of the lip. And as you can see on this, by this mask, it's a medium. So let's open it, the bottom edge, just pull across the perforation, and take all the contents out. That'll give you the mask with the strap. So undo the clips so it's ready to go on the patient when you're ready to start the non-invasive. Okay, so first to, to set up the NIV machine, we first need to turn it on. So we press the power button. We then take the tubing with the filter attached to it out of the bag. filter end, attach it to the machine and then we need to check that all of the settings are correct. So in our department we start with an IPAP of 10, an EPAP of 4 and a backup respiration rate of 12. To change any of these settings you'll need to unlock the machine. To unlock you press the plus and minus buttons together for three seconds and it will unlock and you do the same again to lock the machine so to test the disconnection alarm you leave it off the patient and when it alarms you know it's working so you can cancel the alarm and then attach the mask to the patient so if the settings of the IPAP and the EPAP are incorrect when you get the NIV machine out and switch it on then all you need to do is make sure that the machine is unlocked select the value that you want to change and use the plus and minus buttons to change the settings. When it's 10 over 4, you press set and that's what will be delivered to the patient. So first you attach the tubing to the mask, like that. And then you place a mask over the patient's face. In a cooperative patient, you can get them to hold the mask. Put the mask on so they get used to the... ...experience of the non-invasive. Then these straps go at the back of the patient's head. It's a two-person job to allow you to hold onto the mask and attach the straps. So one strap on either side, and then pull on these tabs here to tighten, and then the same again on the top aspect. And once you have attached the mask, feel around the mask for any leaks, and you shouldn't feel any air coming onto your hand. Yeah, that's it. Um, that's how you should um, connect a patient to um, an IV machine. 
and how to um, connect the mask to the patient. You're not supposed to um, attach straight away mask and put the straps on. Of course, you keep the mask initially on the patient's, uh, um, close to the patient's face and then uh, gradually uh, connect and, um, while discussing with the patient. And that will improve your uh, uh, NIV uh, treatment. So anybody who is being started on any patient who has been started on NIV, you have to maintain something called NIV Performer. This is, of course, uh, something like monitoring uh, chart. So of which um, you, you have to uh, mention the date here, the NIV started date, and then the patient name and the details. Again, uh, this is the same thing I'm repeating. So diagnosis, you get the correct indication, and then initial, um, initiate the medical management, which includes control oxygen, uh, nebulizations, steroids, aminophilins, antibiotics, and extruded pneumothorax. After which the patient is still having a features of type 2 failure, then of course you will start NIV as we discussed earlier with these given pressures of 10 to 15 or maintain saturation 88 to 92. And then uh, repeat ABGs 30 uh, minutes to four, um, 60 minutes after starting. And any changes, after any changes, um, if you're done uh, to the machine. So it says repeat ABG one hour after changing ventilator settings, right? Okay. And these are. Uh, uh, some of the contraindication indications and all which we have discussed already. Uh, in the perform pro, pro again, you have a bit of checklist here. You have to tick this up some of the tip box or yes or no questions. See whether the pH is less than 7.35 and oxygen is um, CO2 more than 6.5. If it's yes, yes, in the circle or tick it. And then accordingly, do this tick boxing. And then uh, uh, name of the responsible senior clinician care uh, case discussed with in the registrar or the senior registrar or the consultant and then name and the signature and then the bleep number this is of course what we use in the uk but of course we don't have to use all these things but if you mention at least who you, who you discussed with that should be adequate i think i haven't seen this type of uh, performance being used in here um, other than in maybe icus but it's i think it's something that we should adopt to uh, places where in navy facilities available um, so this is what you should do while the patient is in IV. So <clears throat> this, see, this is a pH and CO2 improving and a PO2 more than 7.7 7, uh, kilopascals. Of course, you need to continue the NIV with the given settings aiming the saturation of 80 to 92. So repeat EG in four hours. If your patient is doing very well, you need to do the frequent blood gases and you may do either four hours apart or maybe six hours or if you change any settings you know, after one hour. I know there are difficulties in doing blood gases, especially the arterial gases. Um, in the in the center that I practice, or oh, I learn medicine as respiratory medicine in the UK. Um, so my consultant, uh, I mean, he's he's one of the senior consultant who is um, in the guideline committee as well. So he, once your pH is normalized, so we are we are we are not going to normalize these patients' carbon dioxide level. So we need to normalize their pH. So which is 7.35 to 7.3 uh, 7.45 if you achieve the normal ph next thing you can monitor the niv fairly as with uh, apg you can do the venous gases and look at the ph you know if your ph is going down you can assume that your um, arterial co2 is going up in which case you can do a blood gas but otherwise with this uh, crisis we can we can we can monitor them with just the venous gas to see the ph so we are, I mean, every patient, we won't be able to normalize their CO2 level. And we should not as well, because we should normalize their pH level. These patients, when they go back go back home, they can gain slowly retain carbon dioxide. So no point of normalizing CO2, but of course you need to normalize pH too. Uh, otherwise it affects many ways to your body, especially the enzymes and all. Okay. And then uh, see what happens if your pH and CO2 improving, but the oxygen is low. Then, of course, you can increase either FiO2 or increase EPAP. You know, maximum is eight. You will not go beyond that. And then you repeat blood gas in one hour. So, for which, of course, you need arterial blood gas rather than venous gas. And suppose your patient's pH and CO2 not improving, and neither oxygen is also um, an oxygen is okay. So, we know that you have to increase tide volume by increasing EPAP. So it's normally needed by two, you know, if it is 10, you make it 12, and then every five minutes you can go up to until you get the maximum chest augmentation and uh, uh, 
dilutium is achieved. And then you have repeat the gas in one hour again to see whether the maneuvers you've done has um, done good to the patient. Suppose your pH is not improving, CO2 not improving, and your oxygen is low again. So three things, three parameters are not improving. So of course you can increase everything, then increase EPAP, and then you can in increase IPAP as well, and you may increase FiO2 as well accordingly. Whatever you do with the ma machine, if you change anything, any any settings, of course you need to repeat the gas in one. Now, ideally it is arterial blood gas, but you can uh, consider in, in this, this sum, you can consider venous gas rather than arterial gas every time. So in, uh, consider NIV weaning once clinically stable for more than 24 hours. Suppose your blood gas normalized after six hours of starting NIV. Are we going to wean off NIV? No, we should not do that because the next moment patient can go back to the um, CO2 detention again. So that's why they advise for the first 24 hours, patient should be on NIV as much as possible or at least minimally 16 hours. And we are not going to be in of um, um, NIV within the first 24 hours of um, um, commencement of uh, NIV. So it definitely should be 20, uh, 48 hours or so even after that. Right, so this is again the same thing that any changes you've done, you had document in the proforma and the time and all those things. So. Um, this is a um, long chart again, so early chart that you have to mention if somebody started on uh, NIV, right? So NIV troubleshooting. So if, if you started NIV but the patient is not doing very well, of course, you need to look at the patient factors and the machine factors and or, or maybe both. So if the patient is having clinical deterioration, check the patient has appropriate medical treatment, for example, NEBS, steroids, antibiotics, whether we are managing their blood glucose very well, if the patient is dehydrated, correct all those things and repeat blood gas and check ventilator settings as well. And check the pa patient mask fitting and repeat chest x-ray to exclude any new pathologies such as uh, pressure related uh, or, or barotrauma or pneumothorax or sputum retention or aspiration or new, new um, evidence of pneumonia. And does the patient need intubation? Of course, if the patient needs intubation, do not delay that and go ahead with that. Um, and you have to discuss with the critical care people or, or one of your senior doctors. Mm. If there is a leak, of course, consider changing the mask and adjust the straps. Accept, normal acceptable leak is up to 24 liters uh, per minute. So, you know, beyond that is not good. Of course, you need to uh, do some maneuvers to reduce the leak. And sometimes patient ventilated uh, asynchrony or dyssynchrony can happen. So, so you need to uh, adjust the pressure sometimes and, of course, you educate the patients as well to comply with. Uh, the patient is having... Um, Low blood pressure, review EPAP, because EPAP can cause uh, reduced venous return, hence you can have low blood pressure. So of course these patients are uh, kind of um, level two care patients, so you need to maintain their fluid balance adequately. If the patient is agitating, you know, agitation and you know, claustrophobic, so you can consider um, giving some um, sedations like morphine, tiny dose of morphine or lorazepam, or sometimes alprazolam as well, as far as you are giving a dose not to um, uh, stop the respiration. Uh, the patient is having vomiting and nausea, of course, consider, you know, um, gastric um, aspiration or uh, inserting NG tube or uh, prokinetics to improve their gastric motility. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can get um, uh, abrasions over the straps. You can consider some uh, cushions or dressings over the pressure points. So coming into the... Um, weaning of NIV. So this is, um, I mean, there are different uh, uh, guidelines or, or methods of weaning off. This is something that uh, European Respiratory Society or um, ER, ERJ journal um, that um, recently published here. But there are other ways of uh, weaning as well. So acute phase respiratory distress and or acute respiratory acidosis, you put them on NIV. So maximize NIV use with three cycles a day, it's morning, afternoon and night. Resolution of respiratory distress and respiratory acidosis, because you know that you are monitoring the patient with gases and uh, frequent observations, and start NIV weaning with interruption of morning cycle. So initially you stop the morning cycle, and then see whether the patient is going back to the um, original blood gas, which means the patient going back to the type 2 failure. Recurrence of respiratory distress and no respiratory acidosis, of course, if, they are, if the patient is improving and blood gas is still normal, then you can do weaning with suspen suspension of afternoon cycle 
and for last night cycle. With every cycle, you need to do the you need to assess the patient with the blood gas. Suppose you take the patient uh, patient mask off uh, after the morning session, and then you do a gas in the afternoon. See whether the patient is uh, having respiratory acidosis. If yes, of course you need to go back to the the the, the very first uh, uh, settings and then keep the patient still on, which means the patient is not suitable for weaning off. Right. So there is there's another way of uh, weaning off as well. You can do four hours on four hours off, which means um, when the patient's blood gases are improved after the first 24 hours, you can keep the patients on NIV for four hours and then you can keep it off for four hours during which you can give control oxygen and then plus overnight NIV. And then you do a blood gas in the morning, early in the morning, following day, see the patient is okay. If the patient is okay, you take the daytime off and just give the nighttime or nocturnal uh, NIV and do another blood gas on the following day. If it is normal, then you can take the uh, nighttime NIV as well. But if it is abnormal again, go back to the previous sessions of NIV uh, treatment. Right, so these are some of the cases. Uh, see whether you can uh, quickly go through this, uh, those cases. A 65-year-old known COPD epidemic with SOB and cough. On examination, noted to be breathless, saturation 97 on 60% of injury, heart rate 100, 102, blood pressure normal or slightly high, GCS 15 and slightly drowsy, no peripheral edema. Chest X-ray hyperinflation of the chest, white cell 11, hemoglobin 12.5, CRP is th um, uh, 35. This is the blood gas, pH is 7.3, 1 and oxygen is all right, 13. Uh, CO2 is slightly high. Um, CO2 is, um, bicarbonate is uh, within the normal range. Base excess and lactate is as normal as well. So the diagnosis is possible acute exhibition or infective exhibition of COPD plus acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. Um, so the treatment Goals are minimize, medical, optimize medical management, which includes antibiotics, NEPs, steroids, um, hydration, and all, and reassess with blood gas in one hour, consider NIV early. And this patient is 72 year old, known heart failure, COPD, and CKD, a bit of shortness of breath, mainly exertional for the first week, and, um, and now at rest, she's having breathless. On examination, noted to be uh, breathless, saturation 90 on 60% venturi, heart rate 102, blood pressure 1588. GCS okay, slightly drowsy, edema up to the knees. Chest X-ray, cardiomegaly and congestive lung fails, white cell 11, hemoglobin 13, and QN is normal, uh, CRP is 20. Blood gas, you can see the normal pH here, or slightly high probably, uh, normal pH here. Oxygen is pretty low, and CO2 is, again, uh, within the reference range. Bicarbonate is towards the um, uh, lower limit of normal. Base excess is okay, uh, lactate is 2. This patient is likely having um, acute decompensant heart failure plus type 1 respiratory failure. So, of course, the treatment is offloading with diuretics, and you can consider CPAP here because it's type 1 respiratory failure and then support your care. The case 3 is 42 year old known patient with asthmatic abnormal shortness of breath and cough. You can see examination breathless with a saturation of 91 on 60% venturi, heart rate high, blood pressure is okay, GC is 15, chest tight, and wheezes. X-ray was clear, hemoglobin of white cell 16, hemoglobin 14, UN is normal, CRP is 5. Looks like he, she's having um, acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma or um, severe exacerbation of bronchial asthma. If you look at the blood gas, it's in type 2 failure, pH is 1.33, oxygen is low, um, CO2 is um, uh, normal, blood um, bicarb is low, so she's in metabolic acidosis, sorry, and um, most likely it may be a viral infection or uh, early bacterial infection. What are we going to do with this patient? So this patient is acute severe asthma plus metabolic acidosis plus type 1 respiratory failure, high risk of further deterioration to life-threatening asthma, NEP steroid, max sulfate, all your medical management and look for the cause of metabolic acidosis like sepsis, DK, overdose, etc. And this patient to be managing HIV and NIV is not for the treatment modality for this patient. Case 4 is again 65 year old non COPD patient, abdominal person in shortness of breath. Examination again, dyspneic saturation is 92 on 28 of oxygen. Heart rate high, blood pressure is high, slightly. Um, GCS 14, no peripheral edema. Chest X ray hyperinflation of the chest, white cell 11, hemoglobin 12.5, CRP is 35, and blood gas shows pH is 7.21, 1, 
oxygen is eight, this is low, and this is uh, low as well. If you look at the CO2, 7.8, which is above the normal level, and look at the bicarbonate, it's 29, it's towards higher side, base six is four, and the lactate is three. Lactate is high as well. So this patient is like having infectious expression of COPD plus decompensate type respiratory failure. So treatment is optimized, medical management, NIV, and then consider the ceiling of care. Right, however, are we doing the right thing? So the most common cause of failing NIV is lack of patience, awareness, and knowledge, because we are not we are not really bothered to um, explain to the patient, which is why it happens always in our patients. So before you put them on NIV, you have to uh, speak to the patient, the relatives, and what we are going to do, what the machine will do, and what how the machine will help to improve the patient's clinical features. All right, so this is the ideal way of commencing NIV and explain to the patient with patient's experience. Just see whether we can do, we can, whether we can upgrade to our NIV care to this level. Or NIV is a treatment that we use to treat respiratory failure and breathlessness. NIV isn't always comfortable, and when you're suddenly very unwell, it can be quite scary. But when we get it right, NIV can really help to relieve the symptoms of breathlessness, and it's very successful at making you feel better. We have made this video with the help of our patients to try and help you to understand what it might be like if you or someone you know ever has to have acute NIV treatment. You don't hear a lot about it. I knew, I knew nothing, absolutely nothing at all about it until it was explained to me. Knowledge is power. Every time, knowledge is power. And if, if the patient can be aware that, be prepared for something over your face, which you probably more than likely will be terribly frightened of. However, be prepared to know that it can help you. I was able to breathe more comfortable and to be, well, to be alive today. Respiratory failure can be extremely dangerous. It can make you breathless or even unconscious. The respiratory system and the lungs are responsible for getting the oxygen into your body and the body's waste gas, carbon dioxide, out of your body. In respiratory failure, the levels of these gases become abnormal, the oxygen is too low and the carbon dioxide becomes dangerously high. NIV helps to support your breathing and to get these gases back to normal. In order to do this, we have to fit a tight-fitting mask to your face and the NIV machine will apply pressures through that mask to help blow the air in and out of your lungs. There are lots of different sizes and shapes of mask and we try to find the one that suits the shape of your face best. Your doctors and nurses will help you to choose the mask that fits best to your face, but we do know that it still can be uncomfortable. Now, it's up to you whether you can take having something over your face because it's quite it's psychological actually i thought i'd be claustrophobic with it on my face but i wasn't oh i would definitely recommend it I definitely recommend the machines the, the benefit is uh, i mean it's 10 times better anyway when my grandson thinks i'm cool he thinks i'm dad leader i think after we've found the right mask for you, it does take some time for your gases to come back to normal. Whilst you're on the machine, we monitor you very carefully during this time and we will change the settings of the machine in response to the results from your blood gases. Throughout this period, we try and make it as comfortable for you as possible. Whilst you're on the machine, it should make you feel less breathless, it should help your breathing, but it can take some time to get used to. But if you relax, you should be able to feel more comfortable and less breathless. While you're on NIV, you will be looked after in certain areas of the hospital. These areas can be quite busy and quite noisy. They have lots of different alarms and lots of different people. While you're on NIV, you will be monitored very closely. You'll have a probe on your finger monitoring your oxygen levels. You'll have a monitor monitoring your heart rate and we will take your blood pressure regularly. There will be a team of doctors, nurses and physiotherapists to look after you. There will always be a nurse around. They will show you how to take the mask off and how to call them with the call bell. They will be available to make you feel as comfortable as possible and to answer any questions that you might have. Going on is amazing. I know that I'm going to be, it's like a wee tune. It puts me sleep. I, can li I like my audible books, so I'll have a book to listen to. And just go, that, go with it rather than fight it. If you fight it, you're not getting anywhere and you're going to need it anyway and you're not going to get any better if you don't use it. So it's best to just 
take it easy and let yourself go. To monitor the gases in your blood, we need to take arterial blood. The blood test is done in your wrist and we do what we can to minimise the number of blood tests that we need to do. Your doctors, if you're going to be on NIV for a prolonged period of time, may put something called an arterial line into your wrist and this helps reduce the number of times they have to take separate blood tests. For the first 24 hours of treatment, you'll be on the mask pretty continuously. You will be able to have breaks to go to the bathroom, to have cups of tea and to have your chest physiotherapy and take your medication. Over the second and third day, we will slowly bring down the number of hours that you have to have the mask and eventually we'll just be giving it to you overnight. Some people do need to go home with NIV, in which case we will set that up for you while you're in hospital. I was using it all through the night and I was asleep and that was very good. And I woke up with it and after a certain amount of time it felt that as if I, it wasn't there. I was just breathing on my own. You can tell yourself and you can tell your, you know, the patient that you know what, this is actually good for you. So let's get through the uncomfortableness of it, of the actual apparatus and uh, let it do its thing. NIV can be a life-saving treatment, but we know that it is uncomfortable and it can be difficult to tolerate. We aim to make sure that our patients all have control over their treatment and we know that you might not want to have NIV at all or to see somebody you know or love being treated with NIV. Your doctors and nursing team will discuss all the options with you and help you to make the right decision for you. There's lots that we can do to make the treatment more tolerable and help you to get better. Try it. Definitely you must try it to, to experience it, I think. You must try it to experience it for the better for your health. For someone who's never used it, and if they think that it's something that can help them, I would never stop them. I would never say, no, don't do it. It did bring me back from the brink of death. I would definitely say do it. Uh, if you want to improve how you feel and your, your health, I mean, I've seen with my own eyes the improvement over hours uh, and then days, do you know what I mean? So I would definitely say do it. Just go with it, go with it and you will. And you'll be, it'll be the, good, the best thing you've ever done but you'll have to go with it. I think it's just like being a spaceman, really. <laughs> You're just trying something else that's not been tried before. And uh, it's just an adventure, really. how uh, a patient feels and uh, the team educates them on NIV. So I will just run through these uh, questions which I have provided you already from the beginning. Um, so the first question is, a patient with COPD have been able to show some breath uh, following, uh, following his ABG, what is the most appropriate initial measure? Start NIV as a first step, optimize initial medical management, Start CPAP as the first step, intubation and ventilation, treat as pulmonary embolism. So this is the gas. When you look at the gas, the patient is in type 2, respiratory failure. The treatment is optimize initial medical management before you jump into the NIV. So the second, second question is uh, criteria to start NIV or BiPAP. pH should be less than 7.35, CO2 more than 6.5, able to maintain the only airway, all above, on and off above. You know the answer is all above. Uh, the third question is, which of the following is not a contraindication for NIV? Respiratory arrest is a contraindication. Refusal by the patient is a relative contraindication. Frequent omitting is a relative contraindication. GCS4 is a contraindication because, because the patient cannot manage their own, own airway. And the respirator is more than 30 is not a contraindication. They are anyway tachypneic. Um, advantage of early NIV includes intubation rate reduced from 75% to 25%. Mortality rate of the first episode is reduced from 29 to 9%. Hospital stay and cost are reduced by 50%. Overall survival rate is improved and all above. Of course, you know, this is a bit of um, 
um, uh, literacy survey, they all are correct. Uh, the fifth question is uh, NIV or bypass should be, not be considered in infective exhibition of bronchial phase with type 2 failure. Of course, we can initiate acute CV asthma. No, there is no place. All other things okay uh, for NIV. Next question, which of the following is false regarding NIV? Starting pressure is 10. Well, starting EPAP, sorry, starting IPAP is 10. Starting EPAP is 4. AM is to more than 98. Um, up to 15 is uh, leak is acceptable. Optimizing initial medical management is essential before commencing NIV. Yeah, this is true. And this is true as well, because we know the 24 liters per minute and up to 24 liters per minute is acceptable. And we are not going to aim their saturation 98. So, which is wrong. It is 88 to 92. Which of the following is true regarding NIV? NIV cannot be used after mechanical ventilation window, which is wrong. Sedation can be used in NIV. Yes, that's true. NIV should only be started in respiratory unit. No, you can start in a medical unit, ED or anywhere, where there are capable um, people that can handle the NIV. NIV has no place in COPD patient with a chest strain in situ. Well, we discussed that already. Uh, NIV has no place in OSC. That's wrong as well. So the um, correct answer is uh, you can use sedation. Um, while using NIV. Which of the following is true regarding NIV for acute type 2 respiratory failure in COPD? Steroids should not be given, which is wrong. Oxygen should be started at the rate of 15 liters per minute. No, we are going to give with controlled oxygen. Antibiotics can be considered, yes, which is one of the part of uh, optimizing medical management. Nebulizers are optional, which is wrong. Nebulizers are essential, not optional. You have to use that. Ammonia filling can be. Ammonia filling infusion is contrary, which is wrong again. So the correct answer is antibiotic can be considered. The ninth question, which of the following is true regarding monitoring NIV or BiPAP in type 2 failure? Four hourly ABG should be performed until weaning start. No, we are not going to that. Patient education results in high success rate. We already knew that. Always try to normalize blood CO2 level. No, we are not going to do that. Each and every patient, we are going to normalize the pH as much as we can. Change of mask type has no effect on success. Of course, there is. 21% of oxygen cannot be used in NIV, which is a normal air, of course, you can use. So the correct answer is patient education results in high success rate. The last question, which of the following is true regarding weaning of NIV? Patient should be on NIV minimum 16 hours on the day one. Yes, this is true. Uh, ABG should be performed after six hours of any change of setting. No, we know that it is one hour or at least 30 minutes, one hour after that. Or sometimes you can do it four hours if the patient is very stable. Consider NIV weaning once clinically stable for more than 72 hours. No, if the patient is stable more than 40, uh, 24 hours, then you can consider weaning off. You don't have to wait, to wait for three days. If the pH is normal, no weaning is required, which is wrong. When the pH is normal, then only you are planning to wean off. No ABG is required during the weaning off. Of course, you need um, to see the response of weaning. So the correct answer is the patient should be on NIV minimum 16 hours on day one, which is the first 24 hours. And that brings the end of my presentation, I think. Um, I would love to hear your feedbacks, um, uh, any comments or suggestions. If you could uh, please drop me a WhatsApp message to this number or an email to jagatsoni at gmail.com. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Jagat, for that fascinating and very informative lecture on NIV. I think uh, we all have learned a lot in this session. So, uh, before I start the Q&A session, Dr. Jagat, I would uh, like to ask you after the session, if you can play the first video with the sound, that will be great. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, uh, can I go yeah, back? Uh, just, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just after Q&A. Just after q &A. Oh, sorry. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, shall we start? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the first question. What is the difference between high flow nasal oxygen and regular nasal oxygen? Uh, yeah. You know, the regular nasal oxygen from, let's start from nasal cannula and then the normal face mask or simple face mask or venturi mask, they all are low flow. You know, the, the flow of the oxygen is low. I mean, with the high flow, you can generate a flow beyond 15 liters a minute. You normally start with, you know, 20 liters per minute and you can go up to even 40 and 50, sometimes 60, depending on the machine. So that high flow generates kind of automatic or automatic peep, which is a peak expired um, and expired pressure, which helps you to keep the airways open. 
So which is why like, you know, all these patients with COVID pneumonia or um, uh, patient with pneumonia, uh, you can open up the airways by giving high flow. So the normal or ordinary oxygen um, devices are low flow. The high flow is the flow rate that they provide, that the machine provide. The second question, uh, I think you have discussed it this. Uh, the audience need again to uh, answer uh, this topic. Uh, the difference between uh, use of CPAP and the pipe. Yeah. CPAP is normally we consider patient, patient with um, type 1 respiratory failure because that machine or that uh, treatment option will give a continuous pressure throughout the respiratory cycle. There is no pressure changes or pressure difference between inspiration and expiration. And we are not bothered about CO2 retention in type 1 respiratory failure. So you need to oxygenate the patient. So which is why you consider CPAP in a patient with type 1 respiratory failure in contrast to an NIV patient who is having type 2 respiratory failure. Uh, again, regarding the high flow nasal oxygen, uh, what is the use of high flow nasal oxygen in a COVID-19 patient? Well, it depends on the patient's condition. You know, some patients who are, who, for let's say, someone who is been well, doing very well with um, six liters or ten liters of normal oxygen or venturi or you know, suppose if you happen to go to a non-breathing mask in a patient with COVID pneumonia and your saturation size still not hitting the relevant targets, you can then consider before going into intubation, you can consider high flow oxygen by which the machine will deliver high flow rate with um, um, automatically generated uh, small um, PEEP and patient will be, of course, uh, patient will feel much comfortable and will um, most of the patient will improve and the need of intubation and going you know invasive ventilation is pretty much reduced with the early use of uh, high flow especially the patient with covid pneumonia but of course it depends on the stage as well right uh, the next question also again uh, regarding the high flow nasal oxygen uh, what is the use of rox ratio in uh, other in I haven't, of course, uh, I haven't come across uh, that facility, um, but I never use that. But of course, uh, I can, uh, I can, uh, if someone is having anything, I can do the little survey and, of course, uh, send a feedback. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so this is regarding another, again the machine issues. Uh, ST mod in uh, ST mod use of ST mod in a commonly used CPAP machine. I think the resmed uh, machine we have a ST mod. Yeah. Uh, what is the use of ST mode? Well, you normally start with ST mode because it's spontaneous and time. That's what it, it stands for. So when the patient can breathe and patients uh, can maintain their own airway or other words, self maintaining patient, you go for uh, ST mode. Right. Uh, the next question is uh, you discuss about the CPAP, uh, you discuss about IPAP and EPAP. What yeah. will happen if you use the EPAP more than eight? Well, okay, the, the risk of barotrauma is a problem here, you know, with these pressure controls, they don't normally advise go beyond EPAP of 8, you know, because you are expirating and you are applying a pressure as well. So there can be a high risk of barotrauma. Okay, uh, this, then it, this then it should be a pressure gap, is there any uh, recommended pressure gap between IPAP and EPAP? Well, the guideline, if you consider the starting um, guideline pressure is 10 and uh, they say um, initially initial 10 and 4. Now they say um, 15 and 3. I mean, there is reasonable gap there. It, it's something that you should maintain, but it depends all, all depends on the patient's condition and the patient's body habitus as well as. But I don't, I, I normally don't um, uh, give a fixed values for that you have to maintain, for example, IPAP and EPAP between just maintain 8 or something like that. I'm not going to give a such as it, it all depends on the patient actually you know um, even in the even in the for example even in the icu you must have seen someone who is being ventilated and weaning off their pressure support is just six or eight and their pp is like you know five and six so it's very minimal um, gap so it depends on the patient to patient but there is there is no hard and fast rule that you should maintain pressure gap of like eight ten throughout the um, um, niv course what is the place for pressure support and PEEP in NIV? Well, pressure support, of course, that, that's the pressure that we um, uh, apply uh, with the IPAP. So it's something like uh, when you are ventilating, you know, mechanical ventilation, when you do pressure support, it's, it's the same as, but you are here, you are doing non-invasive. 
So it improves the patient's uh, oxygenation and CO2 removal as well. Uh, again, regarding the uh, setup of uh, Ben IP, is there any uh, fixed or recommended title volume we have to deliver in Ben IP? Well, you cannot. You 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 cannot. I mean, with the with the NIV, you cannot design the tight volume like you are doing in mechanical ventilation, right? So the machine will allow you to control the pressures. So you get the pressure, yeah, desired pressure, and then see whether the patient. Of course, at the latter part of the you know resmed, they have. If you go if you go through the screen, there is um, the option that you can see how much your volume is being delivered. But of course, you cannot control the volume of tidal like you are doing in a mechanical ventilator. It's just adjust, adjusting of pressures until you get the desired pressure. Yeah. Uh, the next question on the, again the how to use the uh, NIPS. Uh, what is the place for humidification and the high pressure? The patient high pressure on the NIP when the patient Sorry? is high. The use of humidification and the high pressure of the patient when we use in the NIV. Yeah. Well, the, the machine itself has uh, the water container. You must have seen that, so that will uh, do the high, uh, do the humidification part. If not, if you have connected uh, the oxygen source, suppose you are getting oxygen from a uh, wall oxygen port or a, a jumbo cylinder, there's a humidification uh, port there, so you can do that. Right. The hydration of the patient is different. Yeah, which is normal hydration, like you might need uh, intravenous fluid as well. Did I answer your question or did I get it wrong? Yeah, I think our audience asking uh, whether we have to extra hydrate when the patient is in NIV. Um, not really. I mean, there is no uh, such um, guidelines given. For example, like uh, you have to correct the deficit or something like that. For example, 5% additional or like that. There is nothing you might, as far as the patient's hemodynamics parameters are. asking but otherwise there are no hard and fast guidelines for that but of right. course these patients are critically unwell you might need a bit of extra hydration than non patient who are not known in iv uh, what is the difference between domiciliary niv machine and the standard niv machine we use in hospital yeah well it's a good question actually um and we have even received some uh, NIV machines to our COVID unit, but unfortunately, those are the machines that they prescribe for patients uh, to use as domiciliary machines. These machines do not have, uh, you know, they have oxygen ports, but they cannot, uh, the, the problem with domiciliary NIV machine, you, you cannot change those things. You cannot change the settings. There is a team, separate team. They will come and they will, um, they will set up, they will do the settings and everything, and they will lock the machine. You have, you just have to put the mask on and then uh, uh, then use it overnight, that's it. But that machine cannot be used for the patients who are in the hospital for um, for our treatment purpose. Those things are given for patients who are having nocturnal hypoxia or hypercapnia. Um, so that's, that's the difference, actually. That's the difference. Right. Uh, when you're considering a patient is acute, the what are the options we have when you be using in IV in a patient with restless? And well, are they asked? Option we have in a when you using the NIV. Yeah. So suppose somebody is on NIV and uh, someone is asking um, uh, if the patient is restless, what can we use? Is that they asking? Yes. Exactly. Yeah, well, I, I think I mentioned earlier, you can give a bit of morphine, like, you know, 2.5 subcut uh, a couple of times uh, per day, or you can even use lorazepam, it's available, or alprazolam even would do the job. But I would advise not to give, you know, normal, you know, big doses, otherwise patient might, um, um, you know, might develop uh, respiratory failure on top of NIV. Uh, the last question which has just appeared in the our chat box, when to consider uh, uh, incubation in the patient with already NIV. Is there any maximum duration of NIV we can use in a patient? There's no time duration. Suppose your patient is uh, deteriorating five minutes after the NIV and not tolerating, of course. If the patient is for full escalation, which means um, I2K, of course, you need to um, promptly intubate. Uh, or, I mean, there's no proper time duration. At any time, they can deteriorate. If the patient is for full resuscitation, facility, full resuscitation, then you have to stop NIV and go for mechanical ventilation. Right, that will be all for the Q&A session. Actually, we got
got a lot of questions from you we had to filter and uh, send you to our speaker if you have a more question you can send to us you know our email then we can get your answer back and uh, before winding up i have to thank uh, dr jagat pushkumara uh, it's really great uh, lucky to have you here with this topic uh, which is very informative as well as being the topic to our all and more medical officers uh, Uh, before i wind up i would like to thank uh, sri lankan college of internal medicine and its president dr ganaka senaratna as well as dr uh, nandini nyan prakash for coordinating this with the uh, uh, gmo sri webinar uh, and last on the least our audience who are with us continuously throughout the period of uh, sessions so i would like to thank you all for joining with us i'll hand over the session to dr maliti you can uh, give us a concluding remarks thank you thank you very much sir again i would like to thank dr jagat pushp uh, kumar on behalf of mo and shri uh, for giving your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us thank you very much sir so uh, we are going to wind up our session now we will see you on next week um thank you very much um gmo shri academy and uh, everyone who helped me to um, and of course giving me this opportunity to present this uh, uh, lecture on gmo shri um, uh, web platform thank you very much